He kōna e purangi tēnei nā te reo irirangi o Aotearoa. This is Media Watch. I'm Colin Peacock. This week, the Broadcasting and Media Minister spoke about the public media merger project for the first time since its collapse when a parliamentary committee asked about the sums spent on it and about the new strategy to take RNZ into the future. So, what did he have to say about that? But first, the National Party leader unveiled two dovetail policies this past week that prompted plenty of political debate. We look at how the media ran the rule over them and talk to the author of a timely investigation into the lucrative childcare industry. What I'm really excited about is that we have just discussed three different policies announced by two of the biggest parties. But must three, be election year. Must be election <laughs> year. Three decent policies out there. OK. That was Catherine Ryan winding up her weekly nine to noon politics slot last Monday and delighted to have actual political policies to discuss in it. And she had the leader of the National Party, Christopher Luxon, to thank for dropping a couple into his State of the Nation speech, which was delayed twice by a state of emergency across the nation. And with the State of the National Party in mind, he was under pressure from pundits who have been pointing out a lot lately that political polls have showed party support stalled at around the same level as that of the Labour Party. And Labour has been criticising National for criticising government policies lately while keeping their own away from media scrutiny. So how did the media run the rule this past week over new initiatives unveiled by Christopher Luxon last weekend? Well, most pundits rated his speech last Sunday as a good one and was also a long one, almost half an hour long. And stuff political editor Luke Malpass knew what Christopher Luxon was going to say in it, according to this in last weekend's Sunday Star Times. Christopher Luxon will use his State of the Nation speech today to announce he will hit the brakes on government consultants and the contractor gravy train if elected in October. Stuff understands. Well, they understood right. Right down, in fact, to the railway-based metaphor. Labour has created a gravy train for consultants through its obsession with working groups, ideological pet projects and expensive public sector restructures that are a boon for partners at the big consultancy firms, but are not delivering better results for Kiwis. Luxon is expected to say. And that's what he said, almost word for word, to applause from the faithful right at the end of his address last weekend, where he added this. And under national, this gravy train's going to stop at the station. And that was also mirrored in the headline in the Sunday Star Times, Luxon to take aim at Hitkin's government consultant gravy train. Now, Stuff's political editor also pointed out in that article that when he was in opposition a decade ago, Chris Hipkins also used the consultant spending stick to beat the then national lead government. But as the annual bill is now three times the size it was back then, Luke Malpass wound up in the Sunday Star Times with this prediction. The size of the public sector and what it achieves could well play as some of the mood music for this election year. Well, it's bound to if political journalists are making the playlist for that with the political parties supplying the tunes, as the National Party did last weekend. Now on News Hub at 6 that night, political reporter Amelia Wade also seized on that runaway gravy train. Government consultants, cover your ears. He accused the government of creating a gravy train, and he said, and I quote, the gravy train will stop at the station. Quotable indeed. Though if the gravy train is really that bad, well, wouldn't you want it to not go to the station at all? Anyhow, the next morning, ZB's Kate Hawkesby was impressed. You know, calling out the gravy train and saying that comes to a stop under National, I mean, that'll be music to the ears of hard workers. Disappointing, of course, for those who enjoy the gravy train ride. Though she didn't really ponder whether it was sound or smart or sensible policy, just whether it would prove popular. Whether this all resonates with voters, of course, will be the true test. And I guess a poll will be out at some stage capturing the impact of his speech and whether he's hitting the right notes or not. But he seemed relaxed. There it is again, politics as a kind of musical vibe that may or may not move the citizens, or, as the pundits see us, voters. And while there probably will be another political poll before long, it probably won't tell us much about whether people will vote seven months from now to reduce the billable hours of consultants or other passengers on this unspecified gravy train. Nevertheless, the gravy train was also top of mind when Stuff's brand new daily news podcast, Newsable, launched last Monday. We're checking in with Chippy, the Prime Minister's in to chat, and we've unintentionally got a bit of a gravy theme going on because we're putting National's public service gravy train claims to him, but then we're also talking pies later on in the show. 
and after that, Newsable's Imogen Wells put a pretty blunt question to the Prime Minister that wasn't about pastry products. Would you describe the public sector as a gravy train? No, absolutely not. And it's interesting that the media spun that out into a critique of public service staffing and efficiency, seeing as Christopher Luxon had only really targeted consultants in his gravy train speech last Sunday. And as we heard earlier, he even specified big-time, big partners at consulting firms in that speech. Yeah, and I feel very good about that, that actually big-time, big partners at consulting firms up and down New Zealand, uh, thank you very much, but your money is going away. Which prompted News Hub's Amelia Wade to say this. Luxon, the smiling assassin with his sight trained. Thanks so much. Thank you. See ya. On consultants' contracts. <laughs> Though assassins don't usually give seven months' warning to their targets and half-hour speeches to the media. The spin-off's Toby Manhire said that making whipping boys out of gravy train consultants would be an easy win with the public because... Just as it is nonsense to imagine that all those contracted to the state are chances and charlatans, it's difficult to weep for people that had been earning, say, $9,000 a week working on the now-buried public media merger. Sure is. And two top ranked consultancies worked on that media merger, seemingly without warning of the political risks that led to its collapse, or how the politicians might persuade stakeholders and others in the media that it might be a good idea, or persuade the public of that, for that matter. And as we'll hear shortly here on Media Watch, some of those consultants are still getting gravy, even though that train has ground to a halt. Now, two of the consultancies working on the media merger were among the so-called Big Four, Deloitte and KPMG, and the artists formerly known as Ernst & Young and PricewaterhouseCoopers, EY and PwC, respectively. Indeed, the National Party on Monday said that those four firms earned $97 million from the government in the last financial year, and that's up from $57 million, according to them, in the year that Labour took office, which was 2017. But that doesn't account for much of the total cost of consultants, which National claimed last year was $1.7 billion, a figure repeatedly reported by the media after Christopher Luxon's speech. And on things like transport and the Three Waters, the government's been accused of failing to consult before setting policy, so what exactly is the gratuitous gravy, and how much of it is, in the end, fairly sensible spending? Well, for The Herald, political reporter Thomas Coughlin pointed out that there are two parts to this. There are government departments contracting in expertise that the public service doesn't have, and often that's for major projects or reforms. But then there's also pretty ordinary core public service work that is being done now by consultants and contractors because of staffing shortfalls or sudden lurches in workload. And both red and blue governments down the years have both failed to curb spending on that. Thomas Coughlin went on to say in the Herald that projects in train that were heavy on so-called gravy train consultants might actually require more of them if National gets the chance to unpick those projects, like Three Waters, the Māori Health Authority or the Polytech merger. Meanwhile, for stuff, Esther Taunton prepped a cheat sheet called What is a Consultant Anyway, in which she set out some of the most sky-high fees currently being paid. And under the headline, Where Does the Money Go?, Stuff's Anna White set out where the $1.2 billion on consultants and contractors was spent last year, according to the Public Service Commission. The Herald's Audrey Young also looked through the Public Service Commission's figures on that, making this important point. However, the Commission lists only ministries and departments in the core public service, not Crown entities such as Waka Kotahi and Kainga Order, which also report to Parliament on their expenditure. But last Sunday, Christopher Luxon said he wasn't derailing the gravy train just to save some of that money, but to fund Family Boost, $250 million a year to lower the cost of childcare for lower and middle income earners. News Hub's Amelia Wade saw that like this. Swing voting, young families, the National Party's made a play for your vote. If your family earns below $180,000 a year, it says it will cut the cost of childcare by up to a quarter. It'll introduce a tax rebate, and the maximum you'd get back is $75 a week. And Amelia Wade went on to report the government's rebuttal, that the policy would actually be much more expensive. She says if even a quarter of the 130,000 eligible families increase the number of hours that their child spends in childcare by five hours a week, their policy blows out by $70 million a year. So, ding, 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 it's the start of the childcare cost clash.
And on News Talk ZB the next morning, Mike Hosking reckoned that the policy would prove pretty popular with parents. The actual policy they announced will appeal. Childcare is ruinously expensive, of course, and by taking money off consultants and giving it to low- and middle-income earners, uh, you can't do anything but be popular. But when Labour introduced the 20 hours free policy a few years back, that was pretty popular too, and only in November last year, the government announced $190 million more million over four years to extend childcare subsidies to even more families. The Herald's Thomas Coughlin this week also wondered whether the childcare policy would end up just pushing up the price of childcare and the profits of the providers, and if it's going to be the recipient of even more taxpayer funds, he said extra regulation might be required. Meanwhile, Matthew Hooten saw it like this. We can only hope that National's policy was motivated by lobbying and donations from owners of ECE centres. Because if it is a genuine attempt to help parents, that suggests the blue team has the same problem of ignorance of economics that the red team has. And Newsroom's political editor Joe Moyer was unconvinced by Christopher Luxon's claim that childcare prices won't go up because, he said, it's a competitive market. That seems a tad naive, especially considering reporting from staff on the same day as National's policy was released, which revealed $450 million a year of taxpayer funding goes to for-profit early childhood providers and into the pockets of private investors. Now there, Joe Moyer was talking about the cover story of last weekend's Sunday Star Times. In a well-timed investigation called Raising Children, Rising Profits, Stuff National correspondent Michelle Duff looked into where the public money goes and found that two-thirds of New Zealand's early childcare centres are now run by businesses. Twenty years ago, more than two-thirds were still community-based or not-for-profit. And these days, almost a fifth of the funding goes to just five of the private early childhood education providers. And it's pretty hard to tell just how much of this has approved the standard of care, she found, or the availability of it across the board. But the cost of it certainly is steadily rising. Now, in the same paper, Stuff's political editor was correctly predicting exactly what Christopher Luxon would say about derailing the gravy train for consultants getting cash from the public purse, but he said nothing in that same article about National's big-ticket childcare policy. So, was it just a coincidence that the Sunday Star Times published Michelle Duff's critique of the childcare industry the very same day? That was a complete coincidence. I was just as surprised as anyone else to see that. In fact, that story was, it had been held, it was actually the article that I published or that we published in the Sunday Star Times was meant to go the week before. And in fact, you know, if I had, I'd I'd been working on it for uh, upwards of six months. So yeah, completely coincidental. Yeah, maybe if it had been out the week before, it would have, uh, who knows what impact it would have had. But I think that it's it's, it's good that it's out there now because it's sort of, I I hope, helping to shape a bit of, bit of that debate. Well, one thing that came out of it was, I mean, I didn't know it, so I'm sure a lot of people didn't, was just how much of a private industry it's become. Uh, so if you go back about 20 years, the, the balance was almost the reverse, sort of two-thirds, one-thirds or even more uh, community-based or not-for-profit provision of childcare now very much... The opposite. Does that make it a harder area to investigate, given that it is mostly now um, a private and pretty lucrative industry? Well, the thing that I always wanted to achieve or, or, or wanted to get to with this series was to find out exactly where all the subsidies in early childhood education go. The majority of that $2.3 billion in, in government funding for ECE does go to its, its subsidies paid to childcare providers. So that I knew that if I found out how much money went to these individual entities and could actually sort of pinpoint, you know, how the industry w- was broken up and who got that funding, that that was half of it. The, the rest, which was to try and figure out where that money is spent and exactly how much is going back into children and their education, that was the hard part. You know, these are limited liability companies or in, in some cases with the Wright Family Foundation, it's, it's a trust. You know, some of their consolidated financial statements are public, but th- there's no great detail there. And for a lot of the other ones, you, you can't see. But that's kind of part of the point, that I can't find that out. And, and actually, the government doesn't even know. You know, most people that I spoke to in the sector, uh, uh, you know, whether you're talking to the union or whether you're talking to the Early Childhood Council who are representing private providers... Most of them are saying, you know, the funding model is broken. We need more. We need more money because we can see that over time, 
there are historic funding gaps that, for example, mean that under three-year-olds, that that two-year-old age group receives hardly any subsidy compared to any other any other age group. And during the previous national government, funding was just frozen for a large proportion of that time. So the, the sector is struggling, so we do know that. And everything, in fact, that has got us to this point where parents are paying so much for childcare and some of the quality is pretty questionable, there's no point putting more money in if we, if we can't see where it's going and we don't know that it's making a difference. Well, you also mentioned this week uh, some of the issues in the background. So, for instance, little progress has been made, you said, on a women's employment action plan. Do the media perhaps have a bit of a blind spot on some things that are, you know, really pretty important to families, but in the normal scheme of things aren't really headline or super topical in the way that childcare has been this week because there was a big set piece uh, political announcement by the leader of the opposition? Gendered issues, things that impact women and children, and the the Women's Employment Action Plan has been, they've been working on that for a, for a long time, and I've barely read any reporting on that. It's like a vein of stories there. You can look at every topic with a gender issue and find about five more angles, uh, that, and that just often doesn't get covered. Interesting. Um, but does it frustrate you, I wonder, that the media analysis of this new childcare policy kind of just looks at it as a political strategy to that something the National Party might be doing to persuade women or sort of swing median voters to support national and greater numbers. Do you find it frustrating that uh, much of the media commentary is about this political or electoral appeal of a policy and not the actual idea or innovation that's being proposed? Yeah, I mean, it's it's really reactive, isn't it? Yeah, I, I often, honestly, my political colleagues will probably hate me for saying this, but sometimes I just think that some of the political reporting is just, so, it just seems really far removed from reality. You know, it's like, what is the actual reality for people who are struggling to raise their families or, you know, put food on the table? You know, childcare is in a mess, I think, partly because successive governments have failed to meaningfully address it. Mm. And maybe that's because uh, whatever they would have to do to solve it would be politically unpopular. But, like, just talking and trying to gain points isn't helping most New Zealanders. But I guess political reporters would say, look, it's true that this will be one of the reasons the National Party has put this policy up. You know, they've got political breakdowns and polls, their own research, which might show they're um, not attracting the same levels of support among women. This will be a policy with that in mind to increase their support or their likelihood of securing people's vote for an election. So if the politicians are behaving in this way, then it is sort of legitimate to scrutinise them in yeah. that way. You know, childcare is an issue and and they've put it in the spotlight. They've said they're going to do something. At the end of the day, I actually think it's just good that everyone's talking about it. That's going to hopefully get us somewhere. So this was your last piece uh, for stuff after, I think, six years in this role of national correspondent. And in a way, you think a lot of journalists would love that. You know, national correspondent, you get to focus on issues, um, do some of the in-depth stuff. Uh, which might not be related to the headlines. But why was it that you you want to give up the the job now? Because we're coming up to an election, a lot of important issues to discuss where you might want to put the focus on the issue and not on the politics. I have mixed feelings, Colin. It's been a really tough decision because you're right, you know, the the role that I've had has been sort of a, a dream job in journalism in that I've been given the freedom and the trust to spend months sometimes, you know, working on stories and talking to multiple people and analysing documents and, you know, you know all those things that when you're in the daily grind of journalism, you know, you have to do in the background or you get pulled off to do something else. You know, I've done that kind of journalism too, so I, I know what that's like. So I'm going on to, to do a Master's in Creative Writing and Fiction at the uh, Institute of Modern Letters at Vic Uni, and that's something I've always wanted to do. This theory that a lot of journalists are all frustrated novelists or something will think they've got a, <laughs> a, the great New Zealand novel in them or something like that. But no, it's interesting though, because fiction, creative writing, I mean, that's, it, a, that's a complete break. My son, who's seven, said that I'm uh, going to learn how to make stories up. <laughs> Which some people accuse the media of from time yeah. to time, but yeah, that's a different criticism. For but sure. look, I, look, what I, what I do want to say though is, you know, since I've been 
in journalism, which is I started at the Manawatu Standard in 2007, it has become harder to be a journalist. That's for a number of reasons, but I would say that that right now we're kind of foot soldiers in this war against disinformation. You know, with with social media and with, with being so accessible now, particularly for women journalists, for journalists of colour, for Māori and Pacifica, you know, the amount of abuse and, and hate that that we get just for doing our jobs is completely unacceptable and it's designed to silence. Is this personal for you? You've experienced this personally, individually, and is that a factor in you wanting to do something completely different? Absolutely, I've experienced that individually. If I write a story that's about a gender issue particularly or anything to do with you know, disinformation, then you, like, you almost wouldn't believe the contents of my inbox. You know, I've had... Also, because writing a biography of Jacinda Ardern... Oh, that was actually... Would, would, would oh, yeah. that up a bit as well, I imagine. That's, you know, down to having my personal address, you know, published on, in some of these channels and, and that kind of thing. So, no, the reason I left was because I want to pursue this new project... But I would, I, I would be being dishonest if I said that wasn't, a, you know, a factor in me wanting to take a breather from this work. It, it kind of takes a toll. Not only that, that abuse, but the, the kind of work that I've done over time. You know, I did sort of two years straight of Me Too reporting, which right. is, you know, you're talking to people about some of the worst things that happen to them in their lives. You know, the um, sexual violence, that kind of real trauma-informed reporting. You know, over, over time that does take a little bit of a toll. I mean, more recently we've talked to people from stuff, particularly in, in the region. Some journalists there are a bit unhappy about the regional reorganisation and some misgivings about the focus of the the company and the way it's being run right now, digital projects, podcasts, being seen as a kind of high priority, perhaps less on, you know, the bread and butter journalism, if I can use that phrase, which is... A, bit of political terminology at the moment, but uh, is that any factor in you deciding to leave stuff as a national correspondent after six years that anything to do with the direction of the company right now? No. No, this is a, this is a personal decision. I mean, I, I think that there are things that stuff could do better to support its journalists, and some of those are related to what I was saying before, women journalists and particularly journalists of colour, and that is around helping... Uh, and supporting those who are working on, you know, particularly, you know, traumatic or stories that that could impact them personally, it's hard work, you know, and th- there's there's far more that all organisations could do to make sure that their staff feel supported and continue to do that really important work that they do, which is journalism is a calling. I think that that's how I feel. It's so important, the the work that journalists around the country do day in, day out, for really very little reward, you know, and I know that it can take a personal toll. I think that if we want these voices to keep on bringing us these stories and, to, and, and different perspectives and that kind of thing, then they just need to be supported more. So will you carry on doing some journalism alongside uh, now the creative writing and fiction, or, or do you think you'll come back to it full-time even in the future? Look, you haven't heard the last of me. <laughs> I yeah, I'm definitely going to stick with journalism. It's you know, it's my profession, and I really love it. And I love all the colleagues that I work with and have worked with over the years, and who have done and continue to do great work. So, I'm going to continue to freelance as much as I can. Like once I get my head around how much my workload for this course is, I'll, I'll be doing that, and I'll look to come back in the future. That was Michelle Duff, who finished up this week after six years as a national correspondent for Stuff, with a timely investigation into how the childcare business works and what the public gets for hundreds of millions of dollars in subsidies. And that was published in last weekend's Sunday Star Times, perfectly timed it turns out, on the day that the National Party unveiled a new policy to pump up the public payments for some families' childcare and slash spending on consultants being used by the public sector to pay for that. In other political policy news this week, the government performed what many in the media labelled a U-turn on its emissions-driven policy for transport. Indeed, some said this manoeuvre was actually prompted by media reporting. 
Why did he do this U-turn? Why was he into the idea at 7am and then out of the idea by 2? It was almost like watching a cricket match where there was a run out. It was almost like, yes, no, oh, sorry. Hayden Donnell looked at that in this week's Midweek Media Watch last Wednesday on nights here on RNZ National. And while he was at it, he also looked at one radio station's fight with Pharmac, the growing glut of daily news podcasts and news of a new online outlet for those wanting an alternative to the mainstream media and also to other alternatives to the mainstream media. Also, Hayden looked at public servants in hot water for expressing political views in the media this week, while the Prime Minister had no problem airing his preferences about pies. I think that's where you've got to get the balance right. You've got to get the right balance of, of meat and gravy. Yeah. Altogether too much gravy in the media mix this past week, perhaps. If you missed Midweek Media Watch this week, that's on the Media Watch page of the RNZ website, our section of the RNZ app, or you'll find it in our podcast feed, available wherever you get your podcasts. As we heard earlier, the National Party is targeting government spending on consultants and contractors, and for months that was also part of its opposition to the government's proposed new public media entity. Now that failed the new Prime Minister's bread and butter policy test just last month, before it was due to be brought into being this month. And this week that led to some awkward questions about the sums spent on it so far from the opposition broadcasting spokesperson, Melissa Lee. No break fee at all. No, there's a termination clause in the contract with Deloitte. Deloitte's been paid uh, just beneath 4 million, 3.87 million, and their contract was terminated as soon as we could. By the end of uh, February, we've received their final invoice. Well, that was the Ministry for Culture and Heritage's Deputy Chief Executive, Emily Fabling, explaining there to Parliament's Social Services and Community Committee that Deloitte, which is just one of the consultancy companies who worked on the aborted public media entity plan, has just billed the government for just under $4 million. Melissa Lee also asked why the board that was supposed to be establishing the new entity was still meeting and still getting paid a month after the government dumped the plan. And Emily Fabling also confirmed that the establishment board would have what she called a final closeout meeting soon and then a final report for the minister by the end of this month. And that would bring its work finally to an end. And later, the Broadcasting and Media Minister Willie Jackson raised eyebrows in that meeting when he told the committee that the board's work and the millions spent over four years was not a waste, but a great investment. Yes, I know it's 16.1 million, but we're talking about future-proofing New Zealand media. And while we don't have a merger, uh, we know where we're going. And in a better time, um, Melissa, when we don't have a a cyclone and we don't have the floods of the century, you know, who knows, we might be able to uh, roll that merger out. This was the first time since the Prime Minister announced that the merger had been scrapped last month that Willie Jackson had spoken about it publicly, though in the interim he was also one of the ministers deployed to Hawke's Bay to oversee aspects of the Cyclone Gabriel recovery. But later that day on News Talk ZB, senior political correspondent Barry Soper wasn't at all convinced to hear the minister cite the cyclone as a reason that the merger hadn't happened. He's making no apologies and seemed to even blame the cyclone on uh, canning the project, even though it was dumped uh, before Gabriel hit. And when Willie Jackson was quizzed by Nationals Melissa Lee in Parliament on Thursday, he added a bit of clarity. And yesterday we were talking at a different, in a different uh, environment. Uh, the reality is that the merger is finished, the merger is over. Uh, we will not be bringing it back, not now and not in the future and not in the upcoming campaign. And Willie Jackson's claim that the government is much better informed now about what New Zealanders want was also a surprising one. The public wasn't consulted about the public media plan at all until there was a bill before Parliament, and many of the hundreds of people who submitted on that really didn't like important aspects of it. But if they know where they're going on all this now, as Willie Jackson said there, well exactly where that is isn't clear just yet. Willie Jackson's immediate and most pressing task now is to take to Cabinet a strategy for funding a non-merged RNZ into the future, as well as any other plans for funding or supporting the public media. And as we heard last week, that will also include some provision for old-fashioned AM radio, which proved to be an information lifeline during Cyclone Gabriel, as MP Dr Emily Henderson reminded the Minister this week in that select committee hearing. As you know, I'm from Te Taitokarau Whangarei, uh, and we were recently quite 
and seriously hit by the lovely Gabriel and my family and friends in various pockets and many people around my electorate found themselves relying on AM radio. And it really highlighted how vital the AM RNZ function is. So my question to you is what work has the government done to um, protect and ensure that the vital AM transmission function for what's going to be a world of trouble in the future? And in reply to that, Willie Jackson said AM radio has been underrated and he was pretty bothered by all that kōrero about it closing down lately. I would think that we would be... Uh, we would get a lot of support right across the spectrum uh, because we've seen the results yeah. firsthand. So uh, mm. I'm just I'm just prou uh, pleased that that injection helped and uh, um, well, really saved people's lives. So this then is another part of the strategy which Willie Jackson will soon take to Cabinet and he told the committee he hopes for a green light on that by early next month. And that's pretty soon after that final report from the Public Media Entity Establishment Board, due at the end of this month, which Willie Jackson said would also inform his strategy. So, for now, that strategy remains still firmly under wraps, beyond the short-term financial book-balancing boost, which was signalled by the Prime Minister after he scrapped the merger at the last minute last month. Willie Jackson wound up his appearance before that select committee hearing by telling the committee that the need to get it all right is still urgent. We're talking about an industry that was collapsing on us, and everyone has said that. Everyone knew we had to do something. Some thought, said that, well, we don't have to do, have a merger to do to to fix things. Um, but I think there was a huge acknowledgement right across the sector, um, from from all areas and people with all different political affiliations, that we have to do something, and that that that. Uh, Challenge is still in front of me, and I'm hoping to do that. To, you know, to try and get a cohesive, a cohesive and coordinated strategy going over the next uh, five months. And it will be fascinating to see what is in that cabinet paper for the future of public media funding, and just how much of the findings from what he called money well spent since 2019 can be found in whatever it is that cabinet gives the green light to this time. That's all we have for you in Media Watch this weekend, but we'll be back with more on the media after the 10pm news next Wednesday night with Midweek Media Watch, and then back again at the same time next weekend here on RNZ National.